Come follow me, reading September 30th through October 6th. I am the law and the light. 3 Nephi, chapters 12 through 16. Come follow me, Manuel. Like Jesus' disciples who gathered to hear the Sermon on the Mount in Galilee, the people who gathered at the Temple in Bountiful had lived the law of Moses. They had followed it because it pointed their souls to Christ, and now Christ stood before them declaring a higher law. But even those of us who have never lived the law of Moses can recognize that the standard Jesus set for his disciples is a high one. I would that ye should be perfect, he declared. If this makes you feel inadequate, remember that Jesus also said, Blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This higher law is an invitation, another way of saying, Come unto me, and be ye saved. Like the law of Moses, this law points us to Christ, the only one who can save and perfect us. Behold, he said, I am the law and the light. Look unto me, and endure to the end, and ye shall live. Student Manual Introduction in his mortal ministry, Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount to encourage his disciples to strive towards perfection with full purpose of heart. Following his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the people, to the Book of Mormon people in the Western Hemisphere and again delivered the sermon. <clears throat> the gospel standards contained in this sermon have been reaffirmed in our time through modern revelation. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency observed, The Savior's transcendent message in this Sermon on the Mount is of burning bush importance to all of us. But seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. This message needs to penetrate into our hearts and souls. As we accept this message, we are taking our personal stand in this life. <clears throat> Through your study of these sacred principles in the Book of Mormon, you will gain insights that will help you stay faithful and remain on the road to perfection. 3 Nephi chapters 12 through 14, a blueprint for our lives. The Sermon on the Mount is contained in both the Bible and the Book of Mormon is the Lord's blueprint for perfection. Of this sermon, President Harold B. Lee said, Christ came not only into the world to make an atonement for the sins of mankind, but to set an example before the world of the standard of perfection of God's law and of obedience to the Father. In his Sermon on the Mount, the Master has given us somewhat of a revelation of his own character, which was perfect, or what might be said to be an autobiography, every syllable of which he had written down in deeds, and in so doing has given us a blueprint for our own lives. To the Scriptures, Chapter 12 Jesus calls and commissions the twelve disciples. He delivers to the Nephites a discourse similar to the Sermon on the Mount. He speaks the Beatitudes. His teachings transcend and take precedence over the law of Moses. Men are commanded to be perfect, even as he and his father are perfect. Compare Matthew chapter 5, about A.D. 34. <clears throat> and it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words unto Nephi, and to those who had been called, now the number of them who had been called and received the power and authority to baptize was twelve. And behold, he stretched forth his hand unto the multitude and cried unto them, saying, Blessed are ye, if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen from among you to minister unto you and to be your servants. And unto them I have given power that they may baptize you with water. And after that ye are baptized with water, behold, I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, blessed are ye, if ye shall believe in me, and be baptized. After that ye have seen me, and know that I am. And again, more blessed are they who shall believe in your words, because that ye shall testify that ye have seen me, and that ye know that I am. Yea, blessed are they who shall believe in your words, and come down into the depths of humility, and be baptized. For they shall be visited with fire, and with the Holy Ghost, and shall receive a remission of their sins. Student Manual 3 Nephi chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. Give heed to the apostles. The Savior began his sermon to the Nephites by calling attention to the importance of following the twelve Nephite disciples, whom he had called and given power and authority. Modern revelation has also emphasized the safety and blessings that come by following the Lord's chosen servants. 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why it is of critical importance for us to follow the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles today. The apostolic and prophetic foundation of the Church was to bless in all times, but especially in times of adversity or danger, times when we might feel like children, confused or disoriented, perhaps a little fearful, times in which the devious hand of men or the maliciousness of the devil would attempt to unsettle or mislead. Again, such times as come in our modern day, the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve are commissioned by God and sustained by you as prophets, seers, and revelators. Such a foundation in Christ was and is always to be protection. In such days as we are now in, and will more or less always be in, the storms of life shall never shall have no power over you. Back to the Scriptures. Yea, blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me. President Harold B. Lee defined what it means to be poor in spirit. The Master said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, of course, means those who are spiritually needy, who feel so impoverished spiritually that they reach out with great yearning for help. Every one of us, if we would reach perfection, must one time ask ourselves this question, what lack I yet, if we would commence or climb upward on the highway to perfection. The phrase, who come unto me, is not found in the New Testament version of the Sermon on the Mount, but it clarifies the Savior's teaching. It is, it is blessed to be poor in spirit if we come unto Christ. The Savior described in 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 2, how we begin to come unto him. The statement, who come unto me, can in principle also be applied to other beatitudes. In order to be comforted, verse 4, inherit the earth, verse 5, be filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 6, obtain mercy, verse 7, or see God, verse 8, we must come unto Christ. As the Savior led into his sermon about coming unto him, he mentioned baptism 19 times between 3 Nephi chapter 11 verse 21 and 3 Nephi chapter 12 verse 2 to completely come unto Christ includes accepting the ordinances of salvation President Ezra Taft Benson described additional ways we can come unto Christ come unto Christ through proclaiming the gospel perfecting our lives and redeeming our dead as we come unto Christ we bless our own lives those of our families and our father and heaven's children both living and dead <clears throat> back to the scriptures and again blessed are all they that mourn for they shall be comforted student manual third nephi chapter 12 verse 4 blessed are all they that mourn elder spencer j Condoy of the 70 explained how the beatitudes could be seen as progressive in nature the beatitudes may be viewed as a recipe for righteousness with incremental steps beginning with the poor and spear who come unto christ the next step in the celestial direction is to mourn especially for our sins for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation back to the scriptures and blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth student manual third nephi chapter 12 verse 5 blessed are the meek President Spencer W. Kimball explained that meekness is not weakness. If the Lord was meek and lowly and humble, then to become humble one must do what he did in boldly denouncing evil, bravely advancing righteous works, courageously meeting every problem, becoming the master of himself and the situations about him and being near oblivious to personal credit. Humility is not pretentious, presumptuous, nor proud. It is not weak facilitating nor servile humble and meek properly suggest virtues not weaknesses they suggest a constant mildness of temper and an absence of wrath and passion it is not servile submissiveness it is not cowed nor frightened how does one get humble to me one must constantly be reminded of his dependence on whom depend on the lord how reminds oneself by real, constant, worshipful, grateful prayer. 
back to the scriptures. And blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verse 6, Hunger and Thirst After Righteousness. <clears throat> While serving in the General Relief Society presidency, Sister Sherry L. Du explained the connection between desire, hungering, thirsting, and action, or the ability to work to achieve the desired results. Our ability to hear spiritually is linked to our willingness to work at it. President Hinckley has often said that the only way he knows to get anything done is to get on his knees and plead for help and then get on his feet and go to work. That combination of faith and hard work is the consummate curriculum for learning the language of the Spirit. The Savior taught, Blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hungering and thirsting translate to sheer spiritual labor, worshiping in the temple, repenting to become increasingly pure, Forgiving and seeking forgiveness and earnest fasting and prayer all increase our receptivity to the Spirit. Spiritual work works and is the key to learning to hear the voice of the Lord. Back to the scriptures. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are all the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verse 8, Pure in Heart. Father Joseph B. Worthlin of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it means to be pure in heart. To be without guile is to be pure in heart, an essential virtue of those who would be counted among true followers of Christ. If we are without guile, we are honest, true, and righteous. These are all attributes of deity and are required of the saints. Those who are honest are fair and truthful in their speech straightforward in their dealings, free of deceit, and above stealing, misinterpretation, or any other fraudulent action. Honesty is of God, dishonesty is of the devil, who was a liar from the beginning. Righteousness means living a life that is in harmony with the laws, principles, and ordinances of the gospel. To the Scriptures And blessed are all the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verse 9, Peacemakers. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles testified of the ultimate source for becoming a peacemaker. Coming unto Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace is the pathway to peace on earth and goodwill among men. Bruce R. McConkie, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described how to become a peacemaker. Peacemakers, in the full sense, only those who believe and spread the fullness of the gospel are peacemakers within the perfect meaning of this beatitude. The gospel is the message of peace to all mankind, children of God, those who have been adopted into the family of God as a result of their devotion to the truth. By such a course they become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Back to the scriptures. And blessed are all they who have, who are persecuted for my name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they, are, uh, blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For ye shall have great joy and be exceedingly glad, for great shall be your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verses 3 through 12, the Beatitudes. The Savior's sermon begins with declaration referred to as the Beatitudes. These start with a series of statements that declare, Blessed are. The attitude means to be fortunate, to be happy, or to be blessed. Webster's Dictionary defines the word as a state of utmost bliss. Such words, such words describe the results when saints apply the teachings of this sermon. The Bible Dictionary explains that the Beatitudes describe certain elements that go to form the refined and spiritual character, and all of which will be present whenever that character exists in its perfection. Rather than being isolated statements, the Beatitudes are interrelated and progressive in their arrangement. The Guide to the Scriptures adds, 
The Beatitudes are arranged in such a way that each statement builds upon the one that precedes it. President Harold B. Lee taught that the Beatitudes embodied the constitution for a perfect life. Four of them have to do with our individual selves, and four have to do with the man's social relations with others. The following chart will illustrate that relationship. With self, blessed are the poor in spirit. With others, blessed are the meek. With self, blessed are all they that mourn. With others, blessed are the merciful. With self, blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. With others, blessed are all the peacemakers. With self, blessed are all the pure in heart. With others, blessed are all they who are persecuted for my name's sake. Back to the scriptures. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the salt of the earth. But if the salt shall lose its savor, wherewith shall the earth be salted? The salt shall be thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Student Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 12, verse 13, Salt of the Earth. The Book of Mormon account indicates that to be the salt of the earth is a goal members of the church should strive for. In the Mosaic sacrificial ritual, salt was a reminder that we should remember and preserve our covenants with God. In a similar sense, saints should help restore and preserve the covenants in these latter days. Doctrine and Covenants, section 101, verses 39 through 40, indicates what one must do to be accounted as the salt of the earth. To be considered the salt of the earth carries an important meaning. While serving as a member of the Presidency of the Seventy, Elder Carlos E. S.A. explained to priesthood holders, when men are called into mine everlasting gospel and covenant with an everlasting covenant, they are counted as the salt of the earth and savor of men. They are called to be the savior of men. The word savor denotes taste, pleasing flavor, interesting quality, and high repute. A world-renowned chemist told me that salt will not lose its savor with age. Savor is lost through mixture and contamination, Similarly, priesthood power does not dissipate with age. It, too, is lost through mixture and contamination. Flavor and quality flee a man when he contaminates his mind with, an un with unclean thoughts, desecrates his mouth by speaking less than the truth, and misapplies his strength in performing evil acts. I would offer these simple guidelines, especially to the young men, as the means to preserve one's savor. If it is not clean, do not think it. If it is not true, do not speak it. If it is not good, do not do it. Back to the scriptures. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the light of this people, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Behold, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel? Nay, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Therefore let your light so shine before this people, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verses 14 through 16. Let your light so shine. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles referred to personal experience in emphasizing the importance of being a light for others. Growing up on Long Island in New York, I understood how vital light was to those traveling in the darkness on the open sea, how dangerous is a fallen lighthouse, how devastating is a lighthouse whose light has failed. We, who have the gift of the Holy Ghost, must be true to its promptings so we can be a light to others. Let your light so shine before men, said the Lord, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We never know who may be depending on us, and as the Savior said, we know not but what. They will return and repent and come unto me with full purpose of heart, and I shall heal them and ye shall be the means of bringing salvation unto them. Come follow me, Manuel. 3 Nephi chapter 12, verses 14 through 16. I can be a good example for following Jesus. Sometimes children might not realize how much their examples can bless others. Use 3 Nephi chapter 12, verses 14 through 16 to encourage them to let their light shine. For example, when you read you or your 
In these verses, ask your children to point to themselves. And tell the children about the light you see in them when they follow Jesus and how it inspires you to follow him too. You could also sing together a song that encourages the children to shine like a star, such as I am like a star. To encourage your children not to hide their light, let them take turns hiding or covering a lamp or other light. They could uncover the light each time they name something they can do to be a good example to others. Back to the scriptures. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, one jot nor one tittle hath not passed away from the law, but in me it hath all been fulfilled. And behold, I have given you the law and the commandments of my Father, that you shall believe in me, and that you shall repent of your sins, and come unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Behold, ye have the commandments before you, and the law is fulfilled. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verse 19 broken heart and a contrite spirit. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles testified of the value of having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I witness that redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. This absolute requisite of a broken heart and a contrite spirit prescribes the need to be submissive, compliant, humble, that is teachable, and willingly obedient. Back to the scriptures. Therefore come unto me, and be ye saved. For verily I say unto you, that except you shall keep my commandments, which I have commanded you at this time, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old, old time, that it is also written before you, that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill, shall be in danger of the judgment of God. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of his judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in the danger of hellfire. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verse, verse 22. Whosoever is angry with his brother. The New Testament account of the Savior's teaching is, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The Savior's teachings on the subject in the Book of Mormon are the same except that the phrase without a cause is deleted. This indicates that it is best to avoid anger altogether. It should be noted that the earliest known manuscript for Matthew chapter 5 verse 22 does not contain the phrase without a cause. Back to the scriptures. Therefore, if ye shall come unto me, or shall desire to come unto me, and rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, go thy way unto thy brother, and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come unto me with full purpose of heart, and I will receive you. Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time he shall get thee, and thou shalt be cast into prison. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Thou shalt be, thou shalt by no means come out thence until thou hast paid the uttermost senine, and while ye are in prison can ye pay even one senine? Verily, verily, I say unto you, Nay. Behold, it is written by them of old time, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery already in his heart. Behold, I give unto you a commandment, that ye suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verses 27 through 29, Avoid Lust. Elder Richard G. Scott contrasts both the results and the motivation for love versus those of lust. Love, as defined by the Lord, elevates, protects, respects, and enriches another. It motivates one to make sacrifices for another. Satan promotes counterfeit love, which is lust. It is driven by a hunger to appease personal appetite. One who practices this deception cares little for the pain and destruction caused another. While often camouflaged by flattering words, its motivation is self-gratification. <clears throat> Back to the scriptures. For it is better that ye should deny yourselves of these things, wherein ye will take up your cross, than that ye should be cast into hell. Student Manual, 
3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 30, Take up your cross. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the phrase, Take up your cross. The daily taking up of the cross means daily denying ourselves the appetites of flesh. <clears throat> By emulating the Master who endured temptations but gave no heed unto them, we too can live in a world filled with temptations such as are common to man. Of course, Jesus noticed the tremendous temptations that came to him, but he did not process and pr reprocess them. Instead, he rejected them promptly. If we entertain temptations, soon they begin to in begin entertaining us. Turning these unwanted lodgers away at the door doorstep of the mind is one way of giving no heed. Besides, these would-be lodgers are actually barbarians who, if admitted, can be evicted only with great trauma. Back to the scriptures. It hath been written that whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verily, verily, I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whoso shall marry her, who is divorced, committeth adultery. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verses 31 through 32. Whoso shall marry her, who is divorced, committeth adultery. Elder Bruce R. McConkie described who the Savior here was speaking to and how it applies to us today. This strict law governing divorce was not given to the Pharisees nor to the world in general, but to the disciples only in the house at a later time, as Mark explains. Further, Jesus expressly limited its application. All men could not live such a high standard. It applied only to those to whom it is given. It may have been in force at various times and among various people, but the church is not bound by it today. At this time, divorces are permitted in the church for a number of reasons other than se sex immorality, and divorced persons are permitted to marry again and enjoy all the blessings of the gospel. It would appear that one of the purposes of the Savior's words was not to condemn those who marry divorced people, but to teach the people not to turn to divorce as the solution to all the minor irritations that come up in marriage. And speaking about divorce, President Gordon B. Hinckley has taught, Of course, all in marriage is not bliss. Years ago, I clipped these words from a column written by Jenkins Lloyd-Jones. There seems to be a superstition among many thousands of our young who hold hands and smooch in the drive-ins that marriage is a cottage surrounded by perpetual hollyhocks to which a perpetually young and handsome husband comes home to a perpetually young and ravishing wife. When the hollyhocks wither and boredom and bills appear, the divorce courts are jammed. Anyone who imagines that bliss is normal is going to waste a lot of time running around shouting that he has been robbed. Among the greatest of tragedies, and I think the most common, is divorce. It has become as a great scourge. The most recent issue of the World Almanac says that in the United States, during the 12 months ending with March 1990, an estimated 2.5 2,423,000 couples married. During the same period, an estimated 1,177,000 couples divorced. This means that in the United States, almost one divorce occurred for every two marriages. Selfishness so often is the basis of problems. To many who come to marriage have been coddled and spoiled and somehow led to feel that everything must be precisely right at all times that life is a series of entertainments, that appetites are to be satisfied without regard to principle, how tragic the consequences of such hollow and unreasonable thinking. The remedy for most marriages, marriage stress is not in divorce, it is in repentance. It is not in separation, it is in simple integrity that leads a man to square up his shoulders and meet his obligations. It is found in the golden rule. There must be a willingness to overlook small faults, to forgive, and then to forget. There must be a holding of one's tongue. Temper is a vis vicious and corrosive thing that destroys affection and casts out love. There must be self-discipline that constrains against abuse. There may be now and again a legitimate cause for divorce. I am not one to say that it is never justified. But I say without hesitation that this plague among us, which seems to be growing everywhere, is not of God, but rather is the work of the adversary of righteousness and peace and truth. 
back to the scriptures. And again it is written, Thou shalt not first swear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But verily, verily, I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair black or white. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever cometh of more than this, than these is evil. And behold, it is written, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye shall not resist evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. And behold, it is written also that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But behold, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. Therefore those things which were of old time, which were under the law in me, are all fulfilled. All things are done away, and all things have become new. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 12, verses 17 through 20, and verses 46 through 47. The law of Moses was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> by the time of the Savior's mortal ministry, the law of Moses had been at the foundation of Israelite religious and social life for over a thousand years. The Nephites possessed written records of the law on the brass plates, and Nephites prophets taught and observed the law when the savior visited the nephites he taught them that the law had been completely fulfilled in him however they were not to think of the law of moses as destroyed or having passed away how is it that the savior fulfilled but did not destroy the law of moses the law of moses included both moral and ritual aspects the moral aspects included such commandments as thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery Jesus Christ taught the Nephites that not only were they to avoid murder and adultery, but also anger and lust, conditions of the heart that lead to murder and adultery. Thus, the gospel of Jesus Christ fulfilled the law in the sense that it expanded the moral aspects of the law of Moses by being a higher law. It included the moral imperatives of the law of Moses and placed them in the context of broader gospel principles that required a change of heart. The ritual aspects of the Law of Moses included commandments about animal sacrifice and burnt offerings, what Abinadi called performances and ordinances. The Nephite prophets understood that these parts of the Law of Moses were meant to help people look forward to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when the Savior's mortal mi mission was completed, these forward-looking ordinances could no longer look ahead to a future event. The event had happened, and the ordinances were fulfilled in the sense that it, that it concluded. Thus the Savior taught the Nephites that animal sacrifices and burnt offerings were to be done away, and that his followers were to offer instead the sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. In place of ordinances that looked forward to the atonement, the Savior instituted the sacrament, an ordinance of remembrance, to look back to the Savior's atoning sacrifice. <clears throat> Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, Jesus came to restore that gospel fullness which men had enjoyed before the day of Moses, before the time of the lesser order. Obviously, he did not come to destroy what he himself had revealed to Moses, any more than a college professor destroys arithmetic by revealing the principles of integral calculus to his students. Jesus came to build on the foundation Moses laid. By restoring the fullness of the gospel, he fulfilled the need for adherence to the terms and conditions of the preparatory gospel no one any longer needed to walk by the light of the moon for the sun had risen in all its splendor back to the scriptures therefore i would that ye should be perf perfect even as i or your father who is in heaven is perfect student manual third nephi chapter 12 verse 48 i would that ye should be perfect it is not possible to be perfect in this life however President James E. Faust explained that we must seek for perfection now so as to be able to attain it in the next life. 
Perfection is an eternal goal. While we cannot be perfect in mortality, striving for it is a commandment which ultimately, through the atonement, we can keep. President Spencer W. Kimball also explained the need to strive for perfection. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now that is an attainable goal. We will not be exalted. We shall not reach our destination unless we are perfect. And now is the best time in the world to start towards perfection. I have little patience with persons who say, Oh, nobody is perfect. The implication being, so why try? Of course no one is wholly perfect, but we find some who are a long way up the ladder. Back to the scriptures. Chapter 13. Jesus teaches the Nephites the Lord's Prayer. They are to lay up treasures in heaven. The twelve disciples and their ministry are commanded to take no thought for temporal things. Compare Matthew chapter 6, about 80, or about 80, 34. Verily, verily, I say that I would that ye should do alms unto the poor, but take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father who is in heaven. Therefore, when ye shall do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as will hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and, the fa and thy father who seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not do as the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father who is in secret, and thy father who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Student Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 13, verse 7. Use not vain repetitions. Vain means empty, worthless, having no substance, value, or importance. Our prayers are vain when we offer them out of habit with little thought or feeling. The prophet Mormon warned that if anyone shall pray and not with real intent of heart, it profiteth him nothing, for God receiveth not such. To make your prayers meaningful, you must pray with sincerity and with all the energy of heart. Give serious thought to your attitude and to the words you use. Other Jew Joseph B. Wordland cautioned regarding repetition in prayer. Our prayers become hollow when we say similar words in similar ways over and over so often that the words become more of a re resuscitation than a communication. This is what the Savior described as vain repetitions. Back to the scriptures. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in, as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And, let us not, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 13, verses 9 through 13. The Lord's Prayer. We can use the principles in the Lord's Prayer as a model for our service in the kingdom. President Henry B. Iring of the First Presidency taught. The prayer begins with reverence for our Heavenly Father. Then the Lord speaks of the kingdom and its coming. The servant with the testimony that this is the True Church of Jesus Christ feels joy in its progress and a desire to give his or her all to build it up. The Savior himself exemplifies the standard set by these next words of the prayer, Thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. That was his prayer in the extremity of offering the atonement for all mankind and all the world. The faithful servants prays that even the apparently smallest task will be done as God would have it done. It makes all the difference to work and to pray for his success more than for our own. Then the Savior set for us the standard of personal purity and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
The strengthening we are to give those we watch over comes from the Savior. We and they must forgive to be forgiven by Him. We and they can hope to remain clean only with His protection and with the change in our hearts that His atonement makes possible. We need that change to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. You may have confidence in the Lord's service. The Savior will help you do what He has called you to do, be it for a time as a worker in the church or forever as a parent. You may pray for help enough to do the work and know that it will come. Back to the Scriptures. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, that they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, that 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 thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, who is in secret, and thy Father, who seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Student Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and verses 16 through 18. Do not your righteous acts openly. These verses in 3 Nephi teach about avoiding the giving of money to the poor openly or praying and fasting openly to be seen of others. The Lord encourages us to practice righteousness in private. President Thomas S. Monson explained the value of an anonymous service. I approached the reception desk of a large hospital to learn the room number of a patient I had to come to visit. This hospital, like almost every other in the land, was undergoing a massive expansion. Behind the desk where the, reception, where the receptionist sat was a magnificent plaque which bore an inscription of thanks to donors who had made possible the expansion. The name of each donor who had contributed $100,000 appeared in a flowing script, etched on an individual brass placard suspended from the main plaque by a glittering chain. The names of the benefactors were well known. Captains of commerce, giants of industry, professors of learning, all were there. I felt gratitude for their charitable benevolence. Then my eyes rested on a brass placard which was different. It contained no name. One word and one word only was inscribed anonymous. I smiled and wondered who the unnamed contributor could have been. Surely he or she expressed a quiet joy unknown to any other. A year ago last winter, 1981, a modern jetliner faltered after takeoff and plundered into the icy Potomac River. Acts of bravery and feats of heroism were in evidence that day, the most dramatic of which was one witnessed by the pilot of a rescue helicopter. The rescue rope was lowered to a str str struggling survivor. Rather than grasping the lifeline to safety, the man tied the line to another, who was then lifted to safety. The rope was lowered again, and yet another was saved. Five were rescued from the icy waters. Among them was not found an anonymous hero. Unknown by name, he left the vivid air signed with his honor. May this truth service guide our lives. May we look upward as we press forward in the service of our God and our fellow men. And may we incline an ear towards Galilee, that we might hear perhaps an echo of the Savior's teachings. Do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. And of our good deeds, see thou tell no man. Our hearts will then be lighter, our lives brighter, and our souls richer. Loving service anonymously given may be unknown to man, but the gift and the giver are known to God. Back to the scriptures. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart be also. Come follow me, Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 13, verses 19 through 21. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Reading these verses could prompt a discussion about the things we treasure. Maybe you could lead your children on a treasure hunt to find things that remind them of treasures with eternal value. Back to the scriptures. 
The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 13, verses 19 through 24. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. President Ezra Taft Benson referred to the temporary nature of earthly treasures. Our affections are often too high placed upon the paltry perishable objects. Material treasures of earth are merely to provide us, as it were, room and board while we are here at school. It is for us to place gold, silver, houses, stocks, lands, cattle, and other earthly possessions in their proper place. Yes, this is but a place of temporary duration. We are here to learn the first lesson towards exaltation, obedience to the Lord's gospel plan. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles gave insight regarding the treasures we may lay up for ourselves. The Savior thought that we should not lay up treasures on earth, but should lay up treasures in heaven. In light of the ultimate purpose of the great plan of happiness, I believe that the ultimate treasures on earth and in heaven are our children and our posterity. Back to the Scriptures. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he looked upon the twelve whom he had chosen, and said unto them, Remember the words which I have spoken, for behold, ye are they whom I have chosen to minister unto this people. Wherefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, even so will he clothe you, if ye are not of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth what ye have need of all, that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient is the day unto the evil thereof. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 13, verse 34. No thought for the morrow. The Book of Mormon clarifies the meaning of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 32, by indicating that Jesus was speaking to the twelve Nephite disciples for this portion of the sermon. After Jesus delivered this charge to them, he then turned and began to speak to the multitude again. It is helpful to note that Jesus repeatedly turned back and forth between these two audiences throughout his sermon. Back to the Scriptures, 3rd Nephi, chapter 14. Jesus commands, Judge not, ask of God, beware of false prophets. He promises salvation to those who will do the will of the Father. Compare Matthew chapter 7, about A.D. 34. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he turned again to the multitude and did open his mouth unto them, saying, again saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Judge not, they, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, Judging. Elder Dallin H. Oaks clarified the meaning of verses 1 and 2 in 3rd Nephi, chapter 14, by explaining the difference between righteous and unrighteous, unrighteous judgments. Then he out outlined those righteous principles. I have been puzzled that some scriptures command us not to judge, and others instruct us that we should judge, and even tell us how to do it. But as I have studied these passages, I have become convinced that these seemingly contradictory directions are consistent when we view them with the perspective of eternity. 
The key is to understand that there are two kinds of judging, final judgments, which, were, which we are forbidden to make, and intermediate judgments, which we are directed to make, but upon righteous principles. First, a righteous judgment must, by definition, be intermediate. Second, a righteous judgment will be guided by the Spirit of the Lord, not by anger, revenge, jealousy, or self-interest. Third, to be righteous, an intermediate judgment must be within our stewardship. Fourth, we should, if possible, refrain from judging until we have an adequate knowledge of the facts. Back to the Scriptures. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall be ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. <clears throat> Student Manual, Third Nephi, Chapter Fourteen, Verses Seven Through Eight: Asking Through Prayer. President James E. Faust bore testimony of the gift and privilege we each have of access to our Heavenly Father through prayer. Access to our Creator through our Savior is surely one of the greatest privileges and blessings of our lives. No earthly authority can separate us from the direct access to our Creator. There can never be a mechanical or electronic failure when we pray. There is no limit on the number of times or how long we can pray each day. There is no quota of how many needs we wish to pray for in each prayer. We do not need to go through secretaries or make an appointment to reach the throne of grace. He is rechargeable at any time and in any place. Back to the scriptures. Or what man is there of you who, if his son ask bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Come follow me, Manuel. Third Nephi, chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. Heavenly Father will give me good things as I seek, knock, as I ask, seek, and knock. As you read the Savior's invitation in Third Nephi, chapter 14, verses 7 through 11, to ask, seek, and knock, ponder what good things he might want you to ask for. The following additional scriptures may help you understand how to ask, seek, and knock. They may also help explain why some prayers are not answered the way you expect. How might these passages affect the way you ask, seek, and knock? 3 Nephi chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. Heavenly Father answers my prayers. As you read 3 Nephi chapter 14, verse 7, your children could do actions that represent each of the Savior's invitations in this verse. For example, they could raise their hands, ask, make binoculars with their hands, seek, or pretend to knock on a door, knock. Help your children think of things they can say and ask for in their prayers. Your children might enjoy a game in which they ask for something and receive something entirely different. In 3 Nephi chapter 14, verses 7-11, through 11, what did the Savior want us to know about our Father in Heaven? Back to the Scriptures. Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Student Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 14, verse 12, The Golden Rule. Elder Russell M. Nelson quoted the Golden Rule and gave these comments. Jesus taught the Golden Rule, saying, All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. This principle is found in nearly every major religion. Others, such as Confucius and Aristotle, have also taught it. After all, the gospel did not begin with the birth of the babe in Bethlehem. It is everlasting. It was proclaimed the beginning to Adam and Eve. 
Portions of the gospel have been preserved in many cultures. Even heathen mythologies have been encircled by fragments of truth from earlier dispensations. Wherever it is found and however it is expressed, the golden rule encompasses the moral code of the kingdom of God. It forbids inter interference by one with the rights of another. It is equally binding upon nations, associations, and individuals. With compassion and forbearance, it replaces the retaliatory action of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If we were to stay on that old and unproductive path, we would be blind and toothless. Back to the scriptures. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way, which leadeth to destruction, and many there be who go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 14, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles warned against those who teach or publish false doctrine. Let us beware of false prophets and false teachers, both men and women, who are self-appointed declarers of the doctrines of the church and who seek to spread their false gospel and attract followers by sponsoring symposia, books, and journals whose content challenge fundamental doctrines of the church. Beware of those who speak and publish in opposition to God's true prophets and who actively proselyte others with reckless disregard for the eternal well-being of those whom they seduce. They set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. Back to the Scriptures You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Come follow me, Manuel. Third Nephi chapter 12, verses 21 through 30. Third Nephi chapter 13, verses 1 through 8 verses 16 through 18, and 3 Nephi chapter 14, verses 21 through 23. I can strive to purify the desires of my heart. One theme you might notice in these chapters is the Savior's invitation to live a higher law, to be righteous not only in our actions, but also in our hearts. Look for this theme when the Savior speaks of contentions, immorality, prayer, and fasting. What other examples can you find? What can you do to purify the desires of your heart? Back to the scriptures. Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Student Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 14, verses 22 through 24. The word do emphasize the word do emphasized in the scriptures. Regarding our acting upon the Lord's commands, Spencer W. Kimball said, There are many people in the church today who have failed to do and continue to argue against doing the things that are re requested and suggested by this great organization. The Lord said also, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I was thinking that there are as many wards and branches in the church as there are people in this room, one for one. And what great accomplishment will be accomplished if every bishop and every branch president in all the world, wherever it's possible, of course there are a few places where it is not permitted, had a storage such as has been suggested here this morning, and took to their three or four or five hundred members the same message, 
quoting scripture and insisting that the people of their wards and branches do the things the Lord has requested, for we know that there are many who are failing. And then I hear them argue, well, suppose we do put away a law and then someone comes and takes it from us, our neighbors who do not believe. That's been answered this morning. And so my feeling is today that we emphasize these two scriptures. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And the other, why call ye, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Think of the number of people represented here this day by the stake presidents, mission presidents, and others who are directors, who have many people under them. Our 750 stakes, all of them including hundreds, sometimes thousands, of members, show the power that we have if we go to work and actually push this matter until it is done. We talk about it, we listen to it, but sometimes we do not do the things which the Lord says. Back to the scriptures. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Come follow me, Manuel, Third Nephi, chapter 12. Through 14. I can be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. There's one way to study and apply what the Savior taught in 3 Nephi chapters 12 through 14. Pick a group of verses and see if you can summarize them in one sentence that begins with true disciples of Jesus Christ. For example, a summary of 3 Nephi chapter 13 verses 1 through 8 might be true disciples of Jesus Christ don't seek public praise for doing good. Try it with these passages. After reading these verses, what do you feel inspired to do to follow Jesus Christ? The commandment in 3 Nephi chapter 12 verse 48 can seem overwhelming, even impossible. What do you learn from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland's message, Be ye therefore perfect, eventually? That helps you to understand the Savior's words in this verse. According to Moroni chapter 10 verses 32 through 33, what makes it possible to be perfect like the Savior? Student Manual, 3 Nephi chapters 12 through 14, the Sermon on the Mount repeated. The Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's blueprint for perfection. Of this, Sermon Elder Harold B. Lee said, Christ came not only into the world to make an atonement for the sins of mankind, but to set an example before the world of the standard of perfection of God's law and the obedience to the Father. In his Sermon on the Mount, the Master has given us somewhat of a revelation of his own character, which was perfect, or what we might be said to be an autobiography, every syllable of which he had written down in deeds, and in so doing has given us a blueprint for our own lives. There are several additions or changes in the Book of Mormon sermon which add a great deal of light and knowledge about the teachings found therein. Book of Mormon critics often ask if Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon, from golden play, it's thousands of years old. How could they use the identical language of the King James Version, which was written in 1611? Hugh Nibley answered that question in the following manner. As to the passage lifted boldly from King James Version, we, a we first ask, how else does one quote scripture if not bodily? And why should anyone qu quoting the Bible to American readers of 1830 not follow the only version of the Bible known to them? Actually, the Bible passage quoted in the Book of Mormon often differ from the King James Version, but where the latter is correct, there is every reason why it should be followed. When Jesus and the Apostles, and for that matter, the angel Gabriel, quote the scriptures in the New Testament, do they recite from some mysterious urtext? Do they quote the prophets of old in the ultimate original? Or do they give their own inspired translations? No, they do not. They quote the Septuagint, a Greek version of the Old Testament prepared in the 3rd century B.C. Why so? Because that happened to be the received standard version of the Bible accepted by the readers of the Greek New Testament. When holy men of God quote the scriptures, it is always received standard version of the people they are addressing. 
We do not claim that the King James Version or the Septuagint are the original script scriptures. In fact, nobody on earth today knows whether the original scriptures are or what they say. Inspired men have in every age been content to accept and receive versions of the people among them they labored with the Spirit giving correction where correction was necessary. Since the Book of Mormon is a translation unto the English for English, speaking people whose fathers for generations had known no other scriptures but the standard English Bible, it would be both pointless and confusing to present the scriptures to them in any other form so far as their teachings were correct. Third Nephi chapters 12 through 14, Clarity and Meaning for the New Testament Record. It is per perhaps safe to say that the Sermon on the Mount is the most quoted and the least understood of all the teachings of Jesus. The translation of Matthew's account in this sermon in our present New Testament has caused many people to raise questions concerning the authenticity of this sermon. They ask such questions as the following, Why did the Savior teach that the people were better off being poor in spirit than not poor in spirit? or that they were more blessed mourning than not mourning. When he said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. With what are they to be filled? Hunger, thirst, or righteousness? Also, why did he counsel the people to take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on? What if all people literally followed this admonition? Who would plant and harvest the crops, feed the children, manufacture the clothes, etc.? When the resurrected Jesus Christ appeared to the Nephites, he gave them the same sermon. In fact, he specifically told the Nephites, Behold, ye have heard the, th the things which I taught before I ascended to my Father. However, the account of this sermon in the Book of Mormon is much more complete and makes much more sense than the New Testament account. For example, in the Book of Mormon, the Savior prefaced his sermon by indicating the teachings that were to follow applied only to those who would come down into the depths of humility and be baptized and be visited with fire with the Holy Ghost, and receive remission of their sins. Then he related these prerequisite conditions to each of the Beatitudes that followed. Yea, blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And again, blessed are all they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This more complete version of the sermon changes the entire emphasis of the Beatitudes. Here the Savior is not saying you are more blessed if you mourn than if you do not mourn. But he is saying, if you are called upon to mourn, then you are blessed if you come unto me, are baptized, receive the Holy Ghost, etc. Thus, if you do truly hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. It is also of interest to note that each of the Beatitudes in the Book of Mormon begins with the coordinated conjunction, conjunction and, which helps to relate them back to the introductory statement. The following items help illustrate insights gained from the Book of Mormon sermon. 1. The Salt of the Earth The Bible account reads, Ye are the salt of the earth. The Book of Mormon account indicates that to be the salt of the earth is a goal for which members of the church should strive. In the Mosaic sacrificial ritual, salt was a token of covenants with God. In a similar sense, saints should be tokens or symbols of Christ-like life. Doctrine and Covenants section 101 verses 39 through 40 indicates what one must do to be accounted as the salt of the earth. Number two, whosoever is angry with his brother. The New Testament account of the Savior's teaching is whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The Savior's teachings on this subject in the Book of Mormon are the same except that the phrase without a cause is deleted. Number three, if you shall come unto me, the Bible says if thou bring thy gift to the altar, the Book of Mormon clarifies this by stating that we cannot come unto Christ and at the same time have harsh feelings towards our fellow men. Number four, suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. The Book of Mormon account completely drops the biblical command, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. These verses in the New Testament, which are obviously symbolical ad admonitions, have raised many questions among Bible readers. The Book of Mormon account clarifies the intended meaning of how one avoids lust. Suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. Deny yourselves of these things. The Savior's statement can also better be understood through Book of Mormon examples of how a true saint accepts persecution. We are to accept suffering and persecution patiently, prayerfully, and humbly. Number five, I would that ye should be perfect. 
Elder Joseph Fielding Smith commented in, on this perfection. Of those who receive exaltation in the celestial kingdom are promised the fullness thereof. All things are theirs, therefore a life or death, whether life or death, or things present or things to come. Our Father in heaven is infinite. He is perfect. He possesses all knowledge and wisdom. However, he is not jealous of his wisdom and perfection, but glories in the fact that it is possible for his children who obey him in all things and endure to the end to become like him. Man has within him the power which Father has bestowed upon him, so to develop in truth, faith, wisdom, and all virtues, that eventually he shall become like the Father and the Son. This virtue, wisdom, and knowledge on the part of the faithful does not rob the Father and the Son, but adds to the glory and dominion. Thus it is destined that those who are worthy to become his sons and joint heirs with our Redeemer would be heirs of the Father's kingdom, possessing the same attributes in their perfection as the Father and the Son now possess. Number 6. Vain Repetitions The word vain means empty, hollow, deceiving, lacking genuineness. Vain repetitions in prayer can refer to words or phrases that are used without real thought, feeling, or meaning. It can also refer to set prayers that are repeated over and over. An example is the Zormites wrote prayer from the Tiemptum, which was thoughtlessly repeated each week. Number 7. The Lord's Prayer The prayer Jesus offered here drops the phrase, Thy kingdom come. The reason may be that Jesus established his church and therefore the kingdom had come. Number 8. Take no thought for the morrow. The Book of Mormon clarifies the meaning of Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 through 32 by indicating that Jesus was speaking to his chosen twelve for this portion of the sermon. The Book of Mormon further clarifies this point by saying that after Jesus delivered this charge to the twelve, he then turned and began to speak to the multitude again. Points to ponder. Consider carefully the following review of the Christ-like qualities mentioned in Third Nephi chapter eleven through chapter eleven through fourteen. Seek to understand others does not wait. Seek to understand others and does not have the spirit of contention. See Third Nephi chapter eleven verses twenty eight through thirty. Believes in Christ. See verse thirty three. Is striving to repent. See verse thirty eight has been baptized, see verse 38, has received the gift of the Holy Ghost, see verse 35, heeds the words of God's chosen leaders, see 3 Nephi chapter 12 verse 1, mourns for personal sins, see verse 4, hungers and thirsts after righteousness, see verse 6, is merciful to others, see verse 7, is pure in heart, see verse 8, is a peacemaker, see verse 9, endures persecution patiently, see verse 10 through 12, controls temper, see verses 21 through 22, keeps thoughts pure and does not lust, see verses 27 through 29, is honest and has integrity, see verses 33 through 37, seeks to bless and love enemies, see verses 39 through 45, Gives financial con contributions without desiring the praise of man. See Third Nephi chapter thirteen verses one through four. Praise and fast in secret. See verses five through eighteen. Does not judge his fellow men harshly. See Third Nephi chapter fourteen verses one through five. Third Nephi chapter fifteen through eighteen introduction. Jesus, the law and the light, 3 Nephi 15, 9, continued teaching the people that everyone must look to him in order to receive eternal life. The Nephites heard Jesus pray to the Father for them, and they witnessed a portion of Christ's power as he performed miracles among them. <clears throat> 3 Nephi chapter 15 through 17, Introduction In the time of Moses, the children of Israel were stiff-necked and hard of, hard of heart. As a result, they lost the privilege of living the fullness of the higher law. Instead, along with the portions of the higher law that they were still allowed to live, the law of Moses, the lesser law, was added to help them to come to Christ. After his resurrection, Jesus Christ taught the Nephites that the law of Moses was fulfilled in him. He taught that the old things had passed away and that he is the law and the light. 
to follow. As you read 3 Nephi chapter 15 through 17, notice the difference between the unbelieving Jews and the teachable Nephites. Contrast truths the Savior withheld from those at Jerusalem with the remarkable revelation given in the Americas. Observe that comprehending his teachings requires faith, pondering, and prayer. You will, re you will realize your tremendous worth of paying that price as you read about the indescribable joy experienced by these more faithful disciples and the miraculous experiences of their believing children. To the Scriptures, Chapter 15 Jesus announces that the law of Moses is fulfilled in him. The Nephites are the other sheep of whom he spoke in Jerusalem. Because of iniquity, the Lord's people in Jerusalem do not know the scattered sheep of Israel, about A.D. 34. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these things, he cast his eyes round about on the multitude and said unto them, Behold, ye have heard the things which I have taught before I ascended to my Father. Therefore, whoso remembereth these sayings of mine and doeth them, him will I raise up at the last day. Come follow me, Emmanuel. Third Nephi chapter 14, verses 21 through 27, and Third Nephi chapter 15, verse 1. The Savior wants me to hear and do what he teaches. I think of ways you could help your children visualize the parable in these verses. Perhaps they could draw pictures, do actions, or build things on, sol on solid and sandy foundations. They could also substitute their names for wise men as they read 3 Nephi chapter 14 verses 24 through 27 or sing the wise man and the foolish man. Or they could stand up every time they hear the word doeth in 3 Nephi chapter 14 verses 21 through 27 and 3 Nephi chapter 15 verse 1. Here's an object lesson you could try. Ask your children to imagine that one of the, their legs represents hearing the Savior's words and the other represents doing what the Savior taught. Invite your children to try to balance only on their hearing leg. What would happen if a strong wind blew through the room? Then you and your children could look for specific things the Savior taught us to do. See 3 Nephi chapter 12 verses 3 through 12 verses 21 through 26 and 3 Nephi chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. Back to the scriptures. And it came to pass that when Jesus had said these words, he perceived that there were some among them who marveled and wondered what he would, what he would concerning the law of Moses, for they understood not the saying that old thing had passed away and that all things had become new. And he said unto them, Marvel not that I said unto you that old things had passed away, and that all things had become new. Behold, I say unto you that the law is fulfilled that was given unto Moses. Behold, I am he that gave the law, and I am he who covenanted with my people Israel. Therefore the law in me is fulfilled, for I have come to fulfill the law, therefore it hath an end. Behold, I do not destroy the prophets, for as many as have not been fulfilled in me, verily I say unto you, shall all be fulfilled. And because I said unto you that all things have passed away, I do not destroy that which hath been spoken concerning things which are to come. For behold, the covenant which I have made with my people is not all fulfilled, but the law which was given unto Moses hath an end in me. Student Manual, 3 Nephi chapter 15 verses 5 through 8. The covenant is not all fulfilled. For discussion of what Jesus meant when he said, I do not destroy the prophets, see commentary for 3 Nephi chapter 12, verses 17 through 20, and verses 46 through 47. What did Jesus mean when he said, The covenant which I have made with my people is not all fulfilled? Jehovah made a covenant with Abraham anciently. Abraham was promised, one, eternal posterity. 2. A land that would eventually be the celestial kingdom, and 3. God's priesthood power. These promises were also made to Abraham's descendants and will be fulfilled in the future. Back to the scriptures. Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me and endure to the end, and ye shall live. For unto him that endureth to the end will I give eternal life. 
Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, Chapter 15, Verse 9, The Law and the Light. You will not discover the superiority of the gospel over the law of Moses if you think the law of Moses was harder to live than the gospel. The following statement by Elder Neil A. Maxwell helps illustrate this. One of the ironies which is fostered at times innocently in the church is the feeling we have that the spirit of the law is superior to the letter of the law because for some reason it seems more pers permissive or less apt to offend others. The reverse is true. The spirit of the law is superior because it demands more of us than the letter of the law. The spirit of the law insists that we do more than merely comply superficially. It means, too, that we must give attention to the things that matter most and still not leave the others undone. Back to the scriptures. Behold, I have given unto you the commandments, therefore keep my commandments, and this is the law and the prophets, for they truly testified of me. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Old things and new things. Jesus said that old things had passed away and that all things had become new. The law of Moses, the old covenant, was the preparatory gospel administered by the lesser priesthood. When it was fulfilled, the new covenant, the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, was given. It is important to understand what is meant by the law as opposed to the prophets. At the time of Jesus, the Jewish scriptures, or Old Testament, were divided into three major sections. The law, or the Torah, included the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The prophets included the writings of the various prophets, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The third section, the writings, included the historical books, such as Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, and the poetic books, such as Psalms and Proverbs. The prophecies and covenants given through the prophets but not fulfilled by the atonement and the resurrection were not done away with and are still in force. For example, the promises concerning the eventual gathering of Israel, its restoration to the lands of promise, and the events concerning the ushering in of the millennium belong to the category Jesus called prophets. Some of these promises go all the way back to Adam. Enoch foretold many of them. They are involved in Abraham's covenant. Moses himself gave many of the details concerning these prophetic promises. They also include teachings, such as the Ten Commandments, which never are done away with. Jesus repeated a portion of Malachi and told the Nephites to record it. From this, Latter-day Saints know that the law of tithing was not a part of the law of Moses that was fulfilled in Christ, as some churches claim. The law that was done away with in Christ was the strict ceremonies, observances, and offerings peculiar to the law of Moses. Thus Jesus could say, For behold, the covenant which I have made with my people is not all fulfilled, but the law which was given unto Moses hath an end in me. Note that it was Jesus who instituted, fulfilled, and announced the fulfillment of the law of Moses. 3 Nephi chapter 15 verses 1 through 10 Jesus Christ gave and fulfilled the law of Moses. A later book of Mormon prophets taught that the law of Moses would eventually be fulfilled. Nephi, Jacob, and Abinadi all prepared their people to eventually accept the ending of the law of Moses. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles identified the reasons the Nephites were able to give up the old law and embrace the new. Clearly, the Nephite congregation understood this more readily than did the Jewish world partly because the Nephite prophets had been so careful to teach the transitional nature of the law. Abinadi had said, It is expedient that ye should keep the law of Moses as yet. But I say unto you that the time shall come when it shall no more be expedient to keep the law of Moses. In that same spirit, Nephi emphasized, We speak concerning the law that our children may know the deadness of the law, and they, by knowing the deadness of the law, may look forward unto the, that life which is in Christ, and know for what end the law was given. And after the law is fulfilled in Christ, that they need not harden their hearts against him when the law ought to be done away. That kind of teaching, a caution against hardening one's heart against Christ in ignorant defense of the law of Moses, could have served and saved so many living in the old world then and living through the world now. Back to the scriptures. 
And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he said unto those twelve whom he had chosen, Ye are my disciples, and ye are a light unto this people, who are a remnant of the house of Joseph. And behold, this is the land of your inheritance, and the Father hath given it unto you. Student Manual, 3 Nephi chapter 15, verses 11 through 13, Promised Land. Each of the twelve tribes of Israel was assigned an area of land for their inheritance in the land of Canaan. In addition to the inheritance they received there, the descendants of Joseph also received the land of the Americas as part of their inheritance. The Savior told the twelve Nephite disciples that they and their people were a remnant of the house of Joseph, and this is the land of your inheritance. Third Nephi chapter 15 verses 11 through 13, this is the land of your inheritance. Each of the twelve tribes of Israel was assigned an area of land for their inheritance in the land of Canaan. In addition to what they received in the Holy Land, the descendants of Joseph were also promised the land of the Americas as part of their inheritance. The Savior told the twelve Nephites disciples that they and their people were remnant in the house of Joseph, and this is the land of your inheritance. Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the land of inheritance as follows. Another name for America authorized by the Book of Mormon, is the land of Joseph, referred to by the patriarch Jacob in blessing his twelve sons, and by the prophet Moses in his farewell benediction upon the twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob's allusion to Joseph as a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall was fulfilled in the migration of Lehi and his companions from Asia to America over the Pacific Ocean. It is hardly necessary to add that one of the main features of these western continents are those mighty mountain ranges, the Andes and the Rockies, well turned by the Hebrew patriarch, the everlasting hills, nature's dispositories for the precious things of the earth, gold, silver, and other minerals, and for the precious things of heaven, the sacred records, already discovered in others that are yet to come forth. Back to the scriptures. And not at any time hath the Father given me commandment that I should tell it unto you, your brethren at Jerusalem. Neither at any time hath the Father given me commandment that I should tell unto them concerning the other tribes of the house of Israel, whom the Father hath led away out of the land. This much did the Father command me that I should tell unto them. That other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Student Manual Third Nephi chapter 15, verse 17, One Shepherd. Jesus Christ is often called the Good Shepherd. The metaphor of the shepherd in his relationship to his sheep can, can, can know its personal care and concern. One modern commentator spoke of the personal care involved in the work of the shepherd. By day and by night, the shepherd is always with his sheep. This was necessary on account of the exposed nature of the land and the presence of danger from wild animals and robbers. One of the most familiar and beautiful sights of the East is that of the shepherd leading his sheep to the pasture. He depends upon the sheep to follow, and they in turn expect him never to leave them. As he is always with them and so deeply interested in them, the shepherd comes to know his sheep very intimately. One day a missionary, meeting a shepherd on one of the wildest parts of Lebanon, asked him various questions about his sheep, and among others if he counted them every night. On answering that he did he did not, he was asked how he knew if they were all there or not. His reply was, Master, if you were to put a cloth over my eyes and bring me any sheep and only let me put my hands on its face, I could tell in a moment if it was mine or not. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, speaking about this personal care, said, Jesus is so personal in his shepherding and tut tutoring. Jesus knows and cares for each individual. He watches carefully over the seemingly smallest of things. Back to the scriptures. And now, because of stiff-neckedness and unbelief, they understood not my word. Therefore, I was commanded to say no more of the Father concerning this thing unto them. But verily I say unto you that the Father hath commanded me, and I tell it unto you, that ye were separated from among them because of their iniquity. Therefore it is because of their iniquity that they know not of you. 
And verily I say unto you again, that the other tribes hath the Father separated from them, and it is because of their iniquity that they know not of them. And verily I say unto you, that ye are they of whom I said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And they understood me not, for they suppose it hath been the Gentiles, for they understood not that the Gentiles should be converted through their preaching. And they understood me not that I said they shall hear my voice, and they understood me not that the Gentiles should not at any time hear my voice, that I should not manifest myself unto them, save it were by the Holy Ghost. But behold, ye have both heard my voice, and seen me, and ye are my sheep, and ye are numbered among those whom the Father hath given me. Chapter 16 Jesus will visit others of the lost sheep of Israel. In the latter days the gospel will go to the Gentiles and then to the house of Israel. The Lord's people will see eye to eye when he brings again Zion. About A.D. 34 And verily, verily, I say unto you that I have other sheep which are not of this land, neither the land of Jerusalem, neither in any parts of the land round about, whether I have been to minister. For they whom I speak are they who have not as yet heard my voice, neither have I at any time manifest myself unto them. But I have received a commandment of the Father, that I shall go unto them, and they that, and that they shall hear my voice, and shall be numbered among my sheep that they will be of one fold and one shepherd. Therefore I go to show myself unto them. Student Manual, 3rd Nephi, chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Other Sheep. Verses 1 through 3 of 3rd Nephi, chapter 16, make it clear that there are other sheep besides the Nephites that the Savior planned to visit them. We are told in 3rd Nephi, chapter 17, verse 4, that these other sheep are the lost tribes of Israel. The good shepherd watches over all his flock, caring for them as needed. Back to the scriptures. And I command you that ye shall write these things after I am gone, that if it is so be that my people at Jerusalem, they who have never seen me and been with me in my ministry, do not ask the Father in my name, that they may receive a knowledge of you by the Holy Ghost, and also the other tribes whom they know not of, that these things which ye shall write shall be kept and shall be manifested manifest unto the Gentiles, that through the fullness of the Gentiles, the remnant of their seed, who shall be scattered forth upon the face of the earth, because of their unbelief, may be brought in, or may be brought to a knowledge of me, their Redeemer. And then will I gather them, and from the four quarters of the earth, and then will I fulfill the covenant which the Father hath made unto all the people of the house of Israel. And blessed are the Gentiles, because of their belief in me, in and of the Holy Ghost, which witness unto them of me and of the Father. Come follow me, Manuel. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Very few of God's children have seen the Savior and heard his voice, as the people of Bountiful did. Most of us are more likely the people described in 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 2, 3 Nephi chapter 15, verse 23, and 3 Nephi chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. What promises are made to such people in these verses? How have these promises been fulfilled in your life? Back to the scriptures. Behold, because of their belief in me, saith the Father, and because of the unbelief of you, O house of Israel, in the latter day shall the truth come unto the Gentiles, that the fullness of these things shall be made known unto them. Student Manual, 3 Nephi chapter 16, verses 4 through 7. The Book of Mormon will bring us to a knowledge of Christ. President Boyke Packer, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that a major purpose of the Book of Mormon is to help bring us to a knowledge of, Je of Jesus as the Christ. The central purpose of the Book of Mormon is its testament of Jesus Christ. Of more than 6,000 verses in the Book of Mormon, far more than half refer directly to Him. So we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Back to the scriptures. But woe, saith the Father, unto the unbelieving of the Gentiles, for notwithstanding they have come forth upon the face of this land, and have scattered my people who are of the house of Israel, and my people who are of the house of Israel have been cast out from among them, and have been trodden down 
trodden under feet by them. And because of the mercies of the Father unto the Gentiles, and also the judgments of the Father upon my people, who are the house of Israel, verily, verily, I say unto you, that after all this, and I have caused my people who are of the house of Israel to be smitten, and to be afflicted, and to be slain, and to be cast out from among them, and to become hated by them, and to become a hiss and a byword among them. And thus commandeth the Father that I should say unto you, At that day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations, and above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manner of lyings, and of deceits, and of mischief, and all manner of hypo hypocrisy, and murders, and priestcrafts, and whoredoms, and of secret abominations. And they shall do all those things, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel. Behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. And then will I remember my covenant, which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel, and I will bring my gospel unto them. And I will show unto thee, O house of Israel, that the Gentiles shall not have power over you. But I will remember my covenant unto you, O house of Israel, and ye shall come unto the knowledge of the fullness of my gospel. But if the Gentiles will repent and return unto me, saith the Father, behold, they shall be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. Student Manual Third Nephi chapter 16, 4 through 13. Who are the Gentiles? The majority of references in the Book of Mormon to the word Gentile are references to anyone who is not a Jew. A Jew was anyone who was a descendant of Judah and anyone from the land of Jerusalem, like the children of Lehi. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained that by this definition, many Gentiles did, did have the blood of Israel. In this dispensation of the fullness of times, the gospel came first to the Gentiles and then to go to the Jews. However, the Gentiles who receive the gospel are in the, greater, in the greater part. Gentiles who have the blood of Israel in their veins. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described this as well. We have heretofore identified the Jews as both the na nationals of the kingdom of Judah and their lineal descendants, all this without reference to tribal affiliation. And we have said within this usage of terms that all other people are Gentiles, including the lost and scattered remnants of the kingdom of Israel, in whose veins the precious blood of him whose name was Israel does in fact flow. Thus Joseph Smith of the tribe of Ephraim, the chief and foremost tribe of Israel itself, was the Gentile by whose hand the Book of Mormon came forth, and the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who have the gospel and who are of Israel by blood descent, are the Gentiles who carry salvation to the Lamanites and to the Jews. Third Nephi chapter 16 verses 3 through 13. The Gathering of Israel. For more information on the Gathering of Israel, we refer to the Gathering of Israel in the appendix on page 416. The Gathering of Israel. Who is the house of Israel? The house of Israel generally refers to the descendants of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel in the Old Testament. In the Book of Mormon, the Savior expanded this definition to include not only the literal descendants of Israel, but also all Gentiles who repent, are baptized, and come unto Christ. Israel will be gathered in a fulfillment of covenant. The gathering of Israel in the last days is a fulfillment of the covenant Jehovah made with the prophets of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ repeated this promise in 3 Nephi chapter 20, verses 12 through 13, and verse 29, at which time he indicated that the covenant to gather Israel was the first was first made with Abraham as part of the Abrahamic covenant. The role of the Book of Mormon in gathering of Israel. The Savior taught in 3 Nephi chapter 21, verses 1 through 7, that the coming forth of the Book of Mormon is a sign to the entire world that the Lord has commenced to gather Israel and fulfill covenants he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that the Book of Mormon is central to this work. It declares the doctrines of the gathering, it causes people to learn, about, to learn about Jesus Christ, to believe his gospel, and to join his church. In fact, if there were no Book of Mormon, the promised gathering of Israel would not occur. The gathering of Israel is both spiritual and physical. The spiritual gathering of Israel occurs when someone accepts the gospel of Jesus Christ and is baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles emphasized the importance of spiritual gathering when he stated, The spiritual gathering takes precedence over the temporal. Men can be saved wherever they live, 
but they cannot be saved regardless of their abode unless they accept the gospel and come unto Christ. Jesus Christ taught that there would eventually be two centers of gathering, the New Jerusalem and the Old Jerusalem. As church membership expanded into other lands, President Spencer W. Kimball thought that the gathering place today is wherever someone lives. The gathering of Israel for Mexicans is Mexico, in, Scand in Scandinavia for those of the northern countries. The gathering place for the Germans is in Germany, in the Polynesians in the lands in the islands, for the Brazilians in Brazil, for the Argentines in, the, in Argentina. Our responsibility to help gather Israel. Being an heir to the Abrahamic covenant does not make one a chosen person, per se, but does signify that such are chosen to, to responsibly carry the gospel to all the peoples of the earth. The promise to gather Israel is being fulfilled today as descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. bear the Lord's name, his ministry, and his priesthood to all the families of the earth, thus offering them the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even of life eternal. It becometh every man who hath been warned to warn his neighbor. Back to the scriptures. And I will not suffer my people, who are the house of Israel, to go through among them and tread them down, saith the Father. But if they will not turn unto me and hearken unto my voice, I will suffer them. Yea, I will suffer my people, O house of Israel, that they shall go through among them and shall tread them down, and they shall be as salt that hath lost its savor, which is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of my people, O house of Israel. Student Manual, 3 Nephi, chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. Blessings reserved for the Gentiles. The covenant the Father made with the house of Israel included the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even of life eternal. When the house of Israel rejected the gospel in its fullness, its blessings were removed and given to the Gentiles, hence the Savior's words that the Gentiles too would receive the fullness of the gospel. When the Gentiles rejected the gospel, the word of the Lord will be taken from them and given back to the house of Israel. If the Gentiles then repent and return unto the Lord, behold, they shall be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. Should the Gentiles continue to reject the covenant, however, they will be trodden down and cast out from the promised blessings. It should be remembered that the Book of Mormon uses the title Gentile in a special way. 1 Nephi chapter 13 verses 1 through 3. The Gentiles. Other Bruce R. McConkie said various meaning have been attached to the name Gentiles in different ages, depending on the historical setting or the doctrinal teachings involved. Literally, the meaning is of the same clan or race, and biblical revisions frequently substitute the word nations in its place. The descendants of Noah's son, Japheth, were called Gentiles, and in this sense the descendants of Shem and of Ham would not be Gentiles. In the days of Abraham, the term was used to refer to those nations and people who had not descended from him, with the added assurance that all Gentiles should, who should receive the gospel would be adopted into the lineage of Abraham, and to be accounted his seed. The prophet taught that those so adopted became literally of the blood of Abraham. In the days of ancient Israel, those not of the lineage of Jacob were considered to be Gentiles, although the Arabs and the other races of Semitic origin who traced the lineage back to Abraham would not have been Gentiles in the strict Abrahamic use of the word. After the kingdom of Israel was destroyed and the ten tribes were led away into Assyrian captivity, those of the kingdom of Judah called themselves Jews and designated all others as Gentiles. It is this concept that would have been taught to Lehi, Melech, and the other Jews who came to the Western Hemisphere to, to found the great Nephi and Lamanite civilizations. It is not surprising, therefore, to find the Book of Mormon repeatedly speaking of Jew and Gentile as though this phrase marked a division between all men, to find the United States described as a Gentile nation, and to find the promise that the Book of Mormon would come forth by the way of the Gentile. Back to the scriptures. Verily, verily, I say unto you, thus hath the Father commanded me, that I should give unto this people this land for their inheritance. And then the words of the prophet Isaiah shall be fulfilled, which say, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they, sh for, they s for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. 
Break forth unto joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people and hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God.